Welcome to 30 Minutes of VOA Learning English, the voice of America's information service for people learning English. Join us now for In the News and American Stories, coming up after As It Is. from Washington, and welcome to As It Is, a program from VOA Learning English. I'm Katherine Cole. The cost of college continues to rise, making higher education too costly for some. Many students are turning to online classes as a substitute for traditional colleges. We hear more about the digital college revolution later in the show. Also, lawmakers in Washington continue to debate education issues, including the interest rates on student loans. Students who take school loans graduate owing an average of $26,000. But some economists say the real issue is controlling the cost of college. They say these high costs are hurting the whole economy. Anka Decker reports. Joshua Jordan earned a doctorate degree in physical therapy. I am currently in debt for $210,000. Joshua Jordan has eight times the loan debt of the average student. He says he has sometimes needed to work two jobs to pay his bills. For the past 30 years, college tuition has been increasing at twice the rate of inflation. Universities say decreasing financial support from state governments forces them to charge higher tuition. Private colleges now charge an average of more than $30,000 a year. Terry Hartle speaks for the American Council on Education, which represents thousands of colleges across the United States. It's a terrible conundrum uh, that we face as a country. We want more and more post-secondary education. We want more focus on academic quality and graduation. At the same point, the funding sources for higher education have been diminishing for a generation. Experts worry that the high cost of college makes it less likely that good students from poor families will attend college. This means fewer scientists, engineers, and others who could help increase economic growth. And a survey shows that some students concerned about repaying thousands of dollars in loans are delaying marriage and children. Peter Mazureas is with the College Savings Foundation. These students just will not contribute to the economy. They'll go home and live at home. They won't buy cars. They won't invest in housing. So there's a real multiplier effect that's short term. Georgetown University labor economist Anthony Carnavale says the current system cuts economic growth for the whole country. The effects on e economic growth are substantial. If we'd have kept up with demand for post-secondary talent, economists estimate that we would be at about $500 billion or more per annum in gross domestic product. That is, people would have more money to spend. Meanwhile, physical therapist Joshua Jordan says his family is not wealthy and could not have paid for his education. There would have been no way I could have created a career for myself that I wanted to do without the use of student loans. So for Joshua Jordan, his large debt was worth it. The Department of Education recently reported that today one third of Americans between the ages of 25 and 29 hold college degrees. That is an increase from one-fourth in 1995. I'm Anka Decker. 
You're listening to As It Is from VOA Learning English. I'm Katherine Cole. American colleges are facing what some people are calling a perfect storm of problems. College costs are rising, and there are not enough jobs for all the students completing study programs. Yet employers say they cannot find enough workers with technical skills. Finding a solution to these problems can be difficult. But, as Avi Arditi reports, one solution may be found in the growing number and quality of online classes. Such classes might revolutionize colleges the way the Internet has already changed music, publishing, sales, and other businesses. This is pretty amazing. That is David Evans of the University of Virginia. He is teaching a computer science class on the Internet. Many top universities now offer online classes. They teach everything from computer programming to the science of cooking. Many classes are at little or no cost, and they are restructured more often than traditional college programs. That is important to the millions of students who learn technical and other skills from lynda.com. Linda Weinman helped to launch the website. She spoke to VOA on Skype. We can come to market very quickly and we teach transient skills. So a lot of software is changing constantly or new software is being invented. And those sorts of things can't easily make their way into college curriculum. At most colleges, a professor or teaching assistant gives a lecture to students who then do research, study, and homework alone. Student and blogger John Haber says online classes change everything around. They're watching the lectures at home uh, as homework, recorded lectures, and then when they get to class, they're having more active discussions or interactions with the teachers or working on projects. John Haber said on Skype that he is taking enough online classes to earn a four-year college degree in just one year. Experts say the new technology will have a major effect on colleges. Some predict future classes may be a mix of online lectures and professors helping students work through difficult problems in person. Georgetown University labor economist Tony Carnival says he would welcome these changes. He says a college education has to be less costly and lead to skills needed by employers. It's really quite clear that more and more people need post-secondary education and training, and a lot of them aren't getting it. And in cases where they do get it, uh, it doesn't lead to uh, gainful employment, or it leads to jobs where they don't fully use their talent. He says competition from online schools and concern about costs will change universities. The consumer demands that you tell me why. Give me a reason to believe that my tuition money is best spent at your institution. What is the return on my investment? What's your value proposition? Chris Cullen says top universities with strong public images may expand in an online world. But he says less discriminating, less famous schools may struggle to get the interest of students. I'm Avi Arditi. I'm Catherine Cole. That's our show for today. VOA World News is coming up at the beginning of the hour, Universal Time. next, followed by American Stories. You can read and listen to our programs and download mp3s at learningenglish.voanews.com. You can learn with us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at VOA Learning English. First 
from VOA Learning English. This is In the News. President Obama traveled for two days after giving his State of the Union speech to Congress and the nation earlier this week. He visited four states to support policy plans he proposed in his yearly message. The traditional road trip after a State of the Union speech first took the president to a community in Maryland. He spoke to workers at a Costco store. He told them nobody who works full-time should ever have to raise a family in poverty. In his message to Congress, one of Mr. Obama's major points was that he would reduce the increasing differences in income between America's rich and poor. Other major issues included jobs and immigration. The president said he will continue to reach out to Congress to work on long-term issues. But, he said, he also plans to use executive orders or presidential powers to press for his goals. These include his plans to raise the minimum wage. It would require federal contractors to pay their federally financed employees what he called a fair wage. He said that amount would be at least $10.10 an hour. The current federal minimum wage is $7.25 an hour. If job creation and other improvements continue, Mr. Obama said 2014 could be a year of good progress. But he criticized Republican protests against his health care law, the Affordable Care Act. The law is more commonly known as Obamacare. He urged Republicans in Congress not to vote again to cancel it. The question for folks in Washington is whether they're going to help that progress or hinder that progress, whether they're going to waste time creating new crises for people and new uncertainty, like the shutdown, or are we going to spend time creating new jobs and new opportunities? The shutdown took place last October. It involved a temporary suspension of government services. It took place because lawmakers failed to pass a spending bill in the required time. Mr. Obama noted improvements in the economy, including lower unemployment and increased manufacturing. The jobless rate is now at 6.7 percent, a five-year low. Mr. Obama said the drop results in part from an increase in manufacturing jobs. But the president said it is not enough that more people are working. The president also told the nation about plans to help people who are in the country illegally become citizens. He urged Congress to approve an immigration reform measure that passed the Senate last year. But intense opposition from conservatives has tied up the bill in the House of Representatives. After the speech, Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers gave the Republican Party response. She suggested a different way of balancing the difference in income between rich and poor. She suggested less government. So we hope the president will join us in a year of real action by empowering people, not by making their lives harder with unprecedented spending, higher taxes, and fewer jobs. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell criticized the idea of Mr. Obama using executive orders to gain his goals. From VOA Learning English, that's In the News. I'm Steve Ember. Now, the VOA Special English Program 
American Stories. Our story today is called The Mute Singer. It was written by Stanislav Sukalski. Here is Shep O'Neill with our story. Every year at this time, the peasants began their long religious pilgrimage to Gidle to visit the church there and pray for God's help. They walked or rode in wagons. They crowded the roads leading to the holy town. Gidle was famous in Poland as a place where God did miracles. The cool days also brought many beggars to Gidle. The peasants gave away more of their money on such a religious holiday as this. Some of the beggars were blind. Some had no feet or arms. Some were very old and seemed like lost children looking for their mothers. There was one among them who was called the Mute Singer. He was given this name because he could not speak. There was a time when he was able to sing while playing his guitar, but he lost his voice. Now he played the guitar and sang, but no sounds came from his throat. His lips just moved with the music. The mute singer was a tall, strange-looking man. His face and hands were brown like the color of copper. He had white hair and a white beard. He looked like one of the wise men you read about in the Bible. Early one morning, I saw the mute singer washing himself at the river. He smiled and touched the ground with his hand, meaning that I should sit down. Then he pointed his finger straight up to tell me that he had a surprise for me. Suddenly he put his hand into the water and rubbed two of his fingers together, making a strange sound, exactly like the sound of a croaking frog. He did it many times. Then he lightly hit the top of the water, sending little ripples of waves across the water to the other side. Suddenly, everything around us seemed to be moving. I could not believe it was real. Thousands of frogs came racing toward us, jumping and swimming under the water and on top of the water. I began to shake with excitement. The frogs crowded around us. I could see their heads and eyes showing above the top of the water. The mute singer found some snails and cut them into small pieces and began to feed the frogs. They came closer and closer. The mute singer started to play his guitar. As he did so, the frogs became quiet and listened. And then they too started to sing. Young frogs, old frogs, every one of them began to sing. I never heard anything like it. Not a frog moved. They all just sat and sang. No one ever saw the mute singer at night. 
Nobody even knew where he slept. But during the day, he could be found at the same place, sitting near the church and playing his guitar while his lips moved silently with the music. Everybody liked the mute singer, the peasants as much as the beggars. People threw their pennies into the cups of the beggars sitting on the ground asking for help, but not so with the mute singer. Into his cup they dropped their pennies gently. He used the shell of a turtle as a cup. He got much more money than the others, but this did not trouble any of the beggars. At the end of the day, the beggars crowded around the mute singer in front of the church. He took a clean white handkerchief from the pocket of his old coat and put it smoothly on the ground. He made it seem like a religious ceremony. Then he put all his money on the clean white cloth. He made all the beggars do the same. Then he gave all the beggars an equal share of the money, but kept nothing for himself. Sadly, he looked around at the beggars, covered with dirt and disease. The sun was sinking fast, and the peasants had all left the church area. The mute singer lowered his head and started to pray. The beggars were on their knees, joining him in prayer. Then the mute singer began to play his guitar, moving his lips with the music. The beggars sat still and listened. The music cut deep into their hearts. It cut through their years of pain and suffering and loss of hope. It made them feel human again. Many of them cried and with dried old hands wiped away their tears. I heard a beggar say the mute singer was not a human being, but God dressed as a beggar. If that is true, another answered, he would not come as a beggar, but as a priest. One day, hundreds of new peasants entered the city. They were welcomed at the church by its religious leaders who dropped water on their heads and blessed them. Singing and church bells filled the air, as did the cries of the beggars asking for help. As the peasants came out of the church, the mute singer began to play. The peasants crowded around him and dropped pennies into his cup. Suddenly, his fingers hit the wrong strings. He threw his arms into the air. His guitar fell to the ground and broke. One of the beggars caught the mute singer as he fell and held his beautiful head on his knees. We carried him into my mother's empty barn and put him down gently. I held his hand and he slept a little, then opened his eyes and smiled weakly. He looked like a lost child. The mute singer pointed to his chest and made the sign of the cross. A beggar said, he wants me to give him the last rites of the church. Can you get me a piece of bread? 
But you are not a priest, I said. This is something any man would be glad to do for him. It is an emergency. But I am dirty. My clothes are dirty. Hurry, get some bread and a white shirt. I ran out and got some bread. Next to my house was a synagogue. In the dark I saw the rabbi's finest white shirt hanging to be dried. I took the shirt and hurried to the side of the dying mute singer. The beggar put on the white shirt and gave me a candle to hold. Then he got down close to the mute singer and said, Hear me, my brother. Open your eyes if you can, so that you may see the sign of the cross made over you. Here is your last communion, a beggar's communion of black bread. The dying man looked at the beggar, smiled weakly, and left us forever. That night, I had very strange dreams. In one dream, I saw something white moving slowly toward me. It was like a fog. But when it got very close, it changed into the shape of a man. It was the mute singer, still holding his guitar. Then two angels floated out of the dark into my dream. They fell to their knees before the mute singer, kissing his hands while he gently touched their heads. It was like what I had often seen in old religious paintings. I slept badly. I felt something heavy, and it was hurting me. I awoke and saw that I was holding too hard against my chest, the shell of a turtle. It was the turtle shell which the mute singer used as a beggar's cup for money. He gave it to me while he lay dying. We have just heard the story called The Mute Singer. It was written by Stanislav Zukalski and published by the Atlantic Monthly in July 1964. Shep O'Neill was the storyteller. The producer was Lawan Davis. Listen again next week at this time for another American Stories program in Special English on the Voice of America. This is Shirley Griffin.